got enough hands for everything that needs to go on up here, but I'll do my best. Um, thank you for that welcome. It's been interesting coming back to the Maritimes after 12 years teaching in London. And um, uh, I think one of the most interesting things was that in my 15 years away, I don't recall ever needing to particularly defend myself as a woman, which was a big contrast with what I experienced before going away. And I don't want to spend a lot of time giving you my testimony because we have a workshop this afternoon for those of you who want to join me for that. We'll be able to talk through some of our different experiences together. So I don't want to take away from uh, what I hope is an, an interesting argument. It is to me anyway. Academics are like that, aren't they? Our ideas are always interesting to us. Um, so I don't want to take away too much from that, but just by word, a little bit of testimony, that is exactly what has to happen when a woman is called to ministry because Harry mentioned I grew up in St. John. The church I came from was very conservative, a very Bible-believing and teaching church, for which I'm immensely grateful. Some of the most loving people surrounded me growing up and, uh, and encouraged me always to, uh, to live for Christ, to understand the word, to put it into practice, and gave me every opportunity for service as I grew. And that was really interesting because I eventually would reach a point where uh, I was going off to university, and, and some of the older folks in the church would say, well, really, you need to be a missionary. I've heard about that. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, no, no, I, I, I don't think I'll be a missionary. And uh, uh, it was quite interesting in many ways that, that that was excluded as a possibility, that any kind of ministry calling was excluded as a possibility when they had seen my gifting unfold over many years. And... You know, it, it was a very long story, but to make a very long story short, when uh, a woman goes to study theology and the Bible to prepare for ministry, she has to encounter something that most men do not. And that is, she has to turn to the scriptures and try to understand for herself her own calling, to justify it to herself first, to say, Lord, how can this be that you have called me woman? And we have to trawl through the scriptures so that we can say, well, okay, God, I'll surrender to your sovereignty then. I will, I will submit to your call. And once that happens, then all that study is actually really useful because you have to put it into play when you're talking to everybody else trying to defend uh, your place. And the question is really is, is how much do we need to defend ourselves? How much does the call of women to ministry leadership actually need to be defended at all? And how much should it just be seen as a given? And the question for me, really, that emerged over the years, and it's come back to me quite starkly. Um, I don't know if this will come back on, but hopefully it'll wake up in the ether somewhere. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that has come back to me starkly on returning from the UK is that my modus operandi before going was, I'm a new pastor. I believe God has called me and gifted me. Others have affirmed that. Thankfully, my church ended up affirming that very wholeheartedly and unanimously, as did our, our convention uh, unanimously. And so I felt I had free reign, really, to go and, and minister uh, and did that. Um, and never really felt it was appropriate to make much of a noise about that as an issue, but just to go about my business as a woman in ministry. And that is, that is largely what I did. Uh, on returning, it's, I'll, I'll just tell this story very briefly, I hadn't intended to, but I will. Um, Hugh had actually approached me at some point and said, Anna, you really need to come and be invol involved in ASB. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, Hugh, really, this is such an old issue, I just, I, you know, I can't imagine, <laughs> you, know, that, you know, it takes such time and effort, and as soon as you get involved with that as a woman, you're pegged, you know, you don't have anything to say about the whole wider realm of theology, you're just a woman's theologian, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I said, no, I just, I just don't really want to go there. And, and then, of course, we went to our convention meetings where <laughs> those of you who are there know what this is. Those of you who are not of our denomination probably don't know. But this is a live issue on the floor of our convention. And, I, and this was my first week back. Harry will remember. I just arrived back at the convention. I thought, oh, Lord, what have you done to me? <laughs> and I was like stepping back in time, not 15 years, 30 years, 50 years. And after I heard this conversation on the floor, I sought out Hugh and I said, Hugh, I'm in. <laughs> and 
and the, and the issue for me now is, you know, what, at one point I was even thinking, I was saying, now where on the floor, where are our theologians? Yes. Who's speaking up yes. about these issues? Who's, who's helping our denominations yes. to shape their thinking, to help the churches on the ground to shape their thinking on this? And then I looked in the mirror, <laughs> and I said, oh, Lord, you do have a sense of humor, don't you? And he certainly does. And so I've been wrestling with this whole question, how much do I personally, in the things I've been given, and how much do we corporately, how much do you, in the context where you are, have an obligation to speak up for women in ministry, and what should that look like? So we always had this sense, I think, and I know many women who have been in ministry for quite a long time, their modus operandi is keep your head under the parapet. You just go about your ministry. Yes. Don't draw attention. And, and I completely understand that. Just by the whisper of your life, show that God is called and gifted and so on. Uh, but there comes after a lot of time a sense of frustration that when things don't change, when, when things don't transform, when there isn't movement, there's a, there's a frustration that emerges. And that frustration can emerge as a scream of frustration. And that leads me to ask the question, is there a place for actually speaking far more loudly than we have and than we do without being, I guess, falling over the edge into that, that realm of shrillness that then is never heard? So what I want to do, actually, is explore that a little bit. I'm exploring it because I needed to explore it. And I'm inviting you on this journey of exploration to see with me what you think about this. Do we need to be whispering? Are there places we need to whisper? Do we need kind of a moderate voice somewhere? Where do we scream? Where do we shout and say, this is enough, this is unjust, we've had enough, and does that ever accomplish anything? And how does all of this square? with a biblical ethic anyway. I don't know that we're going to accomplish all of that <laughs> in, in what we have left of our time. But uh, the whisper to a screen, does anybody recognize that? <laughs> What's it from? You're not going to be able to hear that. Oh, you're not going to be able to hear that. Icicle Works in the 80s. One Hit Wonder, Whisper to a Screen was a great song. Um, and when I was thinking about this issue, that song played over and over in my head. It's been my soundtrack for preparing this, and I had it playing just a bit there. But uh, you just turned your volume up. Oh, did he? Oh, I don't. Well, let's see if I can do it again. Then it's not that important, really. But you can share my uh, my soundtrack for just a couple of minutes. Uh -huh. Anybody remember this song? Yeah. No. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I, I owe the title of this one to a screen to high school works. Anyway, I'll just let that play for a couple of minutes. Um, and maybe I'll get that long. Anybody like a bit of retro, ladies? <laughs> <laughs> when I was teaching at LST, the, um, the students under, we lived in residence for a little while, 21 guys in residence, and there were some of them who were really into 80s music, which was wonderful. I'll just wait until it gets to the chorus so you can hear why I chose this title. So it's going to be in your head now. <laughs> Welcome to my club. <laughs> anyway, how am I going to do all of this? How can I do this in a way that makes sense? And as an academic, I wanted to build, first of all, an academic paper, which is what I've done. I'm not going to give you the whole of that, because that would be really boring, I think, for a lot of you. Um, but I hope to distill from what I've been looking at uh, some of the key points that I, I hope are helpful. So the, the, the question becomes, OK, uh, Philip presented last night. It was brilliant. I'm convinced. I'm convinced the biblical argument is supportive of women in ministry leadership. Now what? Now what do I do? Now how do I move forward? Now what is my obligation here? And is it to just get on with it or is it to make a noise as we've been talking about? And I think it's really important to address this question 
uh, because if we have disagreement over methods in the way that we enact things, we can have just as much conflict as we do about the belief of something. And so we can fight just as much over how loudly we should scream about this issue as we do about the issue itself. And I think it's worth thinking that through so that we can at least move forward with some degree of understanding, mutual understanding, of what we're doing when we speak and act on this question. And this question could be addressed in probably a thousand different ways, plus. Um, and I've chosen one. And it could be addressed by trawling through a biblical ethic. Um, but that, that kind of thing has been done and we've drawn from, in the study of ethics, we've drawn out principles of love and of justice. So that, that work in many ways has been done. So I want to move again uh, beyond that to, to another way of addressing the question. But it's not divorced, of course, from all of that, but incorporates all of that. So the way that I want to address this question is I intend to use the redemptive movement, movement hermeneutic of William Webb as a touchstone to talk about the nature of the ultimate ethic and then our ethical obligation to push towards that ultimate ethic or to see that ultimate ethic manifested in our midst today. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll unpack that a little bit as we go. So I don't know how familiar most of you are with William Webb's work. Can I just, some of you are, not everyone. I'll, I'll give you it in a nutshell for those of you who are well familiar with Webb's work uh, will recognize, uh, I'll brush over it in some ways. But I want to give you a sense of what Webb is talking about so that when I use some of his terms and categories, uh, we'll all understand where we're going with that. I have found, uh, over time, Webb's work to be very helpful in understanding the complex relationship between the original culture that was being addressed by the biblical text, the words of the text, and then our contemporary engagement with that and application of the text into a culture that is very different from the original culture in which it was found. This is the age-old task of hermeneutics. And I found Webb very helpful. I guess partly because he has a nice little diagram that I'm a pictorial thinker and that really helps me to understand what's going on. But I also like it because his method, um, I think, does justice both to the text and to the culture. And I think his argument uh, is consistent and, uh, and it helps us to continue moving, even in our own culture, towards a better fulfillment um, of an ethic. It helps us to recognize that the text is not stagnant, that the words exist in the text, but they are living words meant to be applied in every generation and time. And so I have found uh, Webb's work very helpful. His work is contained uh, in a number of places, but I'll be particularly referring to his book, Slaves, Women, and Homosexuals, Exploring the Hermeneutics of Cultural Analysis. It was published in 2001 by IVP, and it re has received mixed uh, reviews. Some have suggested that Webb's view compromised scripture, and others have heralded it as a, an approach to textual application that was mindful of the role of dynamics in culture. And so, uh, it's been an interesting, um, it's been an interesting journey, I think, for for Bill Webb as well in publishing uh, his views on this and in uh, working out the implications uh, of his structure, which I'll introduce to you in a moment. I hope that's clear. Is there any focus button on this projector? No, no, no. Or is it my eyes? I know I'm getting old. Things have to be held at here now. That's a bit blurry. Um, this, in a sense, is a pictorial representation of what Webb is doing in his book. And he says that we have to see this as an X, Y, Z movement. Now, you could pick any letters. He says it doesn't have to be X, Y, Z, but just something that shows movement. And so the way that we read text, he says, is that uh, we, we have the Bible here. This is the on the page, the words of the text, understanding what they're saying. They're there. But he says they're not just simply static sitting there, but they're always lived out and interpreted in some way. And so they addressed, in some ways, the original culture. And if you were standing in the original culture, encountering the words of the text, in many cases, it was calling the culture to a movement in a direction that was redemptive, that was working out God's purposes in history. 
And so the words didn't merely affirm where people were in the culture, but they beckoned people on towards something transformative and, uh, and what he calls redemptive. So it moved the culture in a redemptive direction. Now, when we encounter the text from our culture, he says if we simply look back to the words on the page for a, a literal interpretation, that we actually move in a less redemptive, a regressive uh, move. Because he says actually we have moved in an increasingly progressive, redemptive uh, direction uh, on some issues. The whole point really, and this is going to be very significant for what I want to talk about, is that we are moving in the direction of an ultimate ethic. And the ultimate ethic really is, um, is both textual and eschatological. So it's something that is reflected in the whole of the text together. But it is also eschatological in that it will be the lived ethic in that day when Christ is all in all and his church uh, sees him face to face. Now, in some ways, I mean, Webb has been criticized for, for, um, for referring to this ultimate ethic um, for it being, well, it's not biblical, it's somehow outside of the text. Well, I think theologically we have to recognize that actually the eschaton is, you know, it's not, it's not in conflict with the text, it doesn't contradict the text, but it's a fulfillment of all of that. So it will be greater still than the words on a page. And so what we see when we reflect on the ultimate ethic is a sense of a redemptive spirit, that the meaning behind the words, those old hermeneutical you know, tools that we use to understand what is the principle behind the words, what is the meaning behind the words, and how does that form into an ultimate ethic, and then how do we move towards that, even when it's moving beyond the Bible. And that's what made some people really panic. What does this mean, beyond the Bible? scary term, isn't it, for those who are Bible-believing Christians? Well, really, it's not as scary as it sounds, because what Webb argues, and I think quite convincingly, is that we all move beyond the Bible whenever we live out the words of the Bible. Mm -hmm. There's no way we can embody those words as words. We have to live them out. And so when we take uh, the text, we dig down to the principle behind the text, and then we apply it into our lives, we are then moving beyond the Bible. That is not saying that we are superior to the Bible. It's not saying that we are then in judgment of the Bible, or that we no longer need the Bible, but that the Bible is then functioning <coughs> in the role that it should have in the life of the church, that it should be equipping us for life and for action and so on in, in, in this world. Uh, in another book that he's written on corporal punishment, uh, Webb suggests that even fundamentalists move beyond the Bible. They just don't recognize that they do it. And so in his argument around corporal punishment, he says that you know, many of the American evangelicals, for example, have a principle, a two-smack principle, or two, sorry, it's my British terminology, two, what, what, what would you call it? Two, two strikes? Two strikes, <laughs> yeah. uh, a two-strike principle for corporal punishment. He says, but that you can't find that in the Bible anywhere. What they've done is they've taken some principles, some ethical principles from the text, and they've devised from that um, uh, a belief that violence needs to be limited and so on, and yet children need to be disciplined. And so they brought that together, and the two-strike policy is how they have moved beyond the Bible. I think he's right in his observation there. But what Webb would say is, well, they need to go further, though, because if the ultimate ethic is, a, is, is one where violence is superseded, why stop at a two-strike principle? How can we move beyond that? Now, I don't want it to get into a big conversation about corporal punishment here, because that's not what this is about, but just to see how this movement happens whenever we interpret and live out scripture. And I think Webb is right about that. Um, and, and the challenge becomes, what is this ultimate ethic, really, that we're moving towards? Um, and, and how do we move towards it? Now, unsurprisingly, Webb has friends and foes. Um, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary's Tom Schreiner pointed out that Webb's discussion often comes down to exegesis with which he differs, and it's true at many, many points the discussion often comes down to exegesis. Uh, so that work has to be done. Uh, 
There are others. Wayne Grudem suggested that Webb's trajectory hermeneutic nullifies in principle the moral authority of the entire New Testament, and as such is deeply flawed. Well, no one could ever accuse Grudem of overstatement. Um, <laughs> but to be fair, to be fair, where Grudem differs ultimately from Webb is again an exegetical matter, although Grudem himself seems unable to engage the cultural hermeneutic task by stepping out of his own cultural biases, which perhaps explains his approach to the text in such a static fashion. And many have found and will find that Webb's suggestion of an ethic that is better than that contained in the words of the New Testament, that we're actually moving towards something better sits uncomfortably with them. But there needs to be a sober acknowledgement that all hermeneutical work, all preaching in some sense moves us in that direction towards an eschatological fulfillment of all that has been revealed in the Bible. Howard Marshall also uh, has taken up this, uh, this idea and has written on it. And uh, there are others. Uh, Webb's work spawned a Four Views book, uh, Four Views on Moving Beyond the Bible to Theology. And so this is what we have gained from this, uh, though there are uh, those who stand in favor and those who criticize it. So I have found this trajectory uh, very helpful. I have not found it con contradictory to the biblical text. I've, I've um, found it helpful, really, in seeing how God moves his people in this direction. So, as an example, in his book, Slaves, Women, and Homosexuals, Webb Web uses the example of slavery, how um, there are examples of slavery in Scripture, there are slaves in Scripture, there's instructions for the treatment of slaves in Scripture, and he says, if you were in the original culture and you saw that in the Bible, you were challenged in the way that you were to handle slaves. Um, and then, but, but then if we in our time, when we've actually moved towards the redemption of slaves, and we heard helpfully, Philip, thank you last night about how the early Christians then were involved in, or Christians were involved in, the redemption of slaves and so on, seeing this as a redemptive movement, that that's really the direction we're headed in, uh, that if we stand in our culture and look back to the text as text, we'd say, well, it's all right to have, to have slaves. But this is how our... We're moving in this more redemptive movement. And the principle then is this redemptive spirit where people are equal, ontologically equal, before God in the time of the ultimate ethic. So just because we've ended slavery doesn't mean that that work is done, that the ethic is fulfilled. We still have racism in our midst. It's a constant working out of that redemptive spirit wherever we are so that that ultimate ethic of an ontological equality of people is worked out in our relationships, in the life of the church, and so on. The same thing we could say uh, about the situation of women. And uh, here we are. What the Bible says about women often seems horribly patriarchal. But oftentimes, from the view of the religious, from the view of the dominant culture, hugely liberating. Mm -hmm very contrasting to the culture, moving the culture in a redemptive direction. And so if we in our culture, where it happens to reflect a, a, a more redeemed ethic, to go back to the pages of scripture and use them in a way that undoes that redemptive movement um, is, is actually anti-scriptural, I would argue. And we need to keep pushing towards that ultimate ethic where women and men ontologically equal in the eschaton uh, we, see, we see that fulfilled. So that, that's a very brief, in a nutshell, <laughs> explanation of Webb. Um, are you with me with this so far? Yeah. We, yes. We're okay? It's not too simplistic? Do I need to up it a notch? Well, we're, <laughs> we're okay? <laughs> All right. So what is the relevance for us of this ultimate ethic? This is where um, I would like to take Webb's work and develop it, to be honest, as an ethicist. What is the relevance of this ultimate ethic? Is it something that stands beyond culture, beyond the here and now, as something that will be fulfilled when Jesus comes again? Is, it, is that its relevance, that we hope for that, we pray for it, and we wait patiently for it? 
It is partly that, but that is not all that it is. I would argue, uh, along a line I suppose similar with Tom Wright, that we're talking about the inbreaking of the eschaton. When we look at the ultimate ethic, we have an obligation as the church, who actually already embody the eschaton to some degree. We are already the people of hope. We are already the redeemed. We have a taste of the hereafter. And it's our obligation then as the church to bring that and live it out in the present. And that's why we become so culturally contrasting with the, with the world around us because we're living out a whole different way of being. But we are still susceptible to the cultural trends and pulses that form us as we seek to form them. So we have an obligation as the church, I believe, to live out that ultimate ethic in as much as we can in the present realm. And that comes as a, as a hope and a promise and a great fulfillment to those around us. At least it ought to. That's what it ought to be. <clears throat> so we are an eschatological presence, a presence of that ultimate hope of Christ lived out in the, in, in the here and the now. At the same time, there needs to be a cultural nuance. This needs to be culturally nuanced. This is where I struggle a bit, so you might have to help me. See, I want to just say, well then, if this is the ultimate ethic, let's scream as loudly as we can. <laughs> because it's great news for all people, but not everybody sees it that way. We are, as Christians, formed not only by the gospel, but we are formed by the culture of which we are part. And we often talk about the church and culture in some kind of conflict, and that is sometimes the case, but we, in the midst of that, forget to acknowledge that we are actually part of the culture. We form part of the culture, and it forms us. And so what, what are we to make of all of that? How are we to translate, I guess, as missionaries, uh, this, this view of the eschaton into our culture where we are. And this is, what it, this is where it means that it's going to look differently, probably, in different places and times and locations. And so while I'd love to come out all sort of screaming at the top of my lungs, we have to think what is culturally uh, appropriate in terms of moving a given culture on that redemptive path, but to keep it moving. I had a discussion with Bill Webb uh, just the other day on, about my paper and just asking if I was being fair to him because I said I thought he was being a bit static on this point uh, because he, he, he argues that um, it's better, for example, to be a complementarian who loves your wife than to be in an egalitarian marriage where there is no love. And I had to concede the point. I had to concede the point that there are better and worse ways of, of, of living out uh, the ultimate ethic. But I told him that by conceding that, people would sometimes potentially hear, well, it's okay where I am. I don't have to move. And, and that certainly is not his view, he assured me. So there is this need to keep moving wherever we find ourselves. There's a need to keep moving. Um, and he told me that he has, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing it, he told me he has a poster uh, that he, someone gave to him or he found somewhere. Um, of, of, uh, it was an argument in support of slavery, and there was a sick slave on a, on a bed, and the master was looking after the sick slave. And this was used as an argument for slavery, because where would this, this poor person be if they didn't have a master looking after them in their sickness? And he said that reminds him always that we have to keep moving. Whatever argument we have for things being okay as they are, we have to keep moving. Uh, and he appeals back to 1 Corinthians and Paul's constant pushing, constantly pushing. He never relaxes. He's always pushing so that things uh, move forward. And, uh, and I found that uh, challenging and helpful. So there are places in this world, for example, where to go in and to scream about equality would put you in jail, at least. Uh, there are churches where going in and screaming about equality will lead to nothing but a shut door. How do we discern where is the place to whisper and where is the place to scream? And here I'm going to turn to some of my other uh, ethical friends to help me build an argument. <clears throat> Good 
one of the problems then, this is why I've been referring to, is that we can drive a wedge when we discuss this between love and justice, and this is ethical language, love and justice uh, intimately related in Christian ethics, and if we're loving people, then we don't need to scream about justice. Um, if, if we see the eschaton as, as love, and this world as justice, we might simply fight all the time. We might say it's all about regulation, it's all about the application of rules and laws that will forward the cause. And so what I want to, us to think about as we move on is what does it look like if we hold love and justice together, both this side of glory and in the eschaton. Um, so that's, that's where we're going with that. If you didn't get that, just leave it. Um, so one of my best friends, um, I don't agree with a whole lot of it, but some of my best friends I don't agree a whole lot with. But, um, but Reinhold Niebuhr I've spent a lot of time with um, because I, I think he has a really helpful construct when we look at how individuals and groups uh, work out ethics, and I think he has something to say here. And so what Reinhold Niebuhr would say is that love is at the heart of all Christian ethics. Um, love works out individual to individual Christian. So if I'm sitting down and talking with you about this issue, I can as an individual human being with a will, I can access the grace of God enough to love you even when we differ, so we can work this out. Um, so in an individual sense, I would say that the suggestion there is, is we, we whisper to one another uh, with a sense of love when we meet one another face to face. And those of you who have been active on this issue, you know you've probably had countless conversations with people face to face. To go in and scream about it doesn't get anywhere, but you can have these conversations. Sometimes it seems the conversations don't go anywhere either, let's be honest. Um, <clears throat> that's for another day. Um, but on that, on that basis, we can seek forgiveness of sin, access the grace of God, live out an ethic of love one to another, and individuals can recognize their sin and can repent of it. And it may be in this case that whispering is the most appropriate method. It may be that as we minister as women called by God and equipped and gifted by Him, that simply by living our lives, we're providing a whisper that makes people think, that makes them reconsider, and so on. And I hope that happens. But I will say that the very existence of women in leadership does, isn't always received as a whisper. Sometimes it's received as a shout. And, uh, and the, um, we receive the, uh, the fallout from that just by existing. Um, <clears throat> it's worth knowing that, I think. I'm sure everyone here knows that. Just because of who you are. <laughs> it's, it's amazing to me. Um, <clears throat> So this is, this is how Niebuhr saw individuals working. But he said ethically, when we're talking about groups of people, it gets more complicated. And Niebuhr did not believe that a group of people had a single will in the same that an individual had. And so he contended that within a group, and although I would say, with all the time I've spent with Niebuhr, it's probably a slight over-exaggeration, and I'd want to be a bit more positive about what the Spirit of God can accomplish in a group. I think on the whole he was right that this is complicated with groups because it's hard in a group to rise above the lowest common denominator. That's what he said. Anyone who's ever been in a church meeting knows this to be true. It's very difficult to rise above the lowest common denominator. And yet, uh, that is exactly what we're called to do. So how, does the, how do we deal with this? And my mind inevitably goes back to that, in that first convention on the convention floor that was not an individual situation. It was group coming to group. It was two different views that had a group of people coalesced around them. What happens in that kind of situation? Well, Niebuhr would say those groups are not able in the same way to exercise the will of an individual. And so we're no longer talking about love, agapic love being applied from the eschaton into the present. What we're talking about is justice. This, for Niebuhr, is love divided. It, it suggests that it can, there are better and worse ways of being, better and worse ways of doing. And although Niebuhr was so sometimes cynical that he didn't see there could be any movement, I would suggest there needs to be movement, and that it's love that enables movement to happen. 
So that's why love needs to be held in the picture, whereas Niebuhr saw it as living in the eschaton and not mm -hmm. really relevant to the here and now when we're talking about groups. Am I making any sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, good. So <clears throat> I hope you can see then where my discussion is taking us. If the ultimate ethic is one of equality of persons, then we have an obligation as collectives to strive towards that justice towards ever better forms of justice, and thereby to make love manifest in the presence. And But unlike our work as individuals, I think sometimes in those group settings, depending on the context, I'm recognizing cultural diversity here, but I'm speaking, I suppose, to, to my context, one that I am most familiar with, and, and saying that perhaps there is a place where whispering is not the most effective place, because as Niebuhr said, group pride is strong. Group pride works against hearing and listening to the Spirit of God. Uh, group pride seeks its own agenda. Group pride wants to extend its will to power over others. And let's not forget that that can be us as well. And that keeps us humble. If our agenda becomes our agenda and our will to power, and not a submission to God, uh, then we can be exactly the same. If justice is to be applied in such a situation, uh, Niebuhr would say, then things like laws need to be introduced, regulations, policies that encourage those who are not quite caught up to move along on that redemptive path. That's my argument when I pull these things together. So in a, in a situation like that, perhaps we need to harken back to the policies that are already in place. But how do we simply, how do we not simply just sit there, but then move the whole thing along? And I think perhaps that's a time when, although at that point I was sitting silent, it is appropriate to have a screen. <laughs> Knowing the time and the place for the screen, I think is important. Um, and. Uh, if I can refer back to Bill Webb again, um, he reminded me, he said, remember, the Old Testament prophets had all kinds of methods for getting their message across. He said, never forget that some of them even ran around naked. <laughs> I assure you that would not happen <laughs> down east. Um, <laughs> but the point is a useful one. There are prophetic moments where a voice has to be heard, where whispering is not enough. And I'm not talking here about the shrillness uh, of, a, of a voice that can never be heard because it is so shrill and, and, and so on, but a voice that is dissonant with, um, with the improper harmony that has been struck in a group that raises that issue that, that this is not acceptable, this is not dissonant, this is, this is a time to move things forward, this is not a time to go backwards. And so the scream comes out, a scream of frustration, of marginalization, of exclusion. And even that scream of frustration and marginalization and exclusion needs a place. There are women in our midst from our churches and in our denominations who are so frustrated. They need a place just to scream. Is that true? Amen. Amen. And then there needs to be a place for that scream to become productively heard. By, uh, by the other groups w expressed within the structures that exist. There's a time when a stand must be taken. If this is the ultimate ethic, and we're convinced of it, and scholars like Philip convince us of it, then there comes a time and a place where the shouts have to echo in the corridors. And perhaps it's the only way to challenge the prideful inclinations of groups and the structures that they have put into place. But at the same time, I'll remind us again, we must always recognize that even our cries for justice will ring of our own prideful inclinations to power, because we are sinful human beings. And this should keep us humble, even as we scream. So love transcends law, but agapic love does not govern group relations. So justice seeks to transform the legislative practices and behaviors of the unjust party. It is divisible, there are better and worse forms. And you can start by legislating rights, 
But I think we have to always push towards a voluntary acceptance and a loving endorsement. And this is where Nicholas Wolterstorff, um, I think, brings a helpful corrective to Niebuhr. Because as I was saying, for Niebuhr, there is this divide between agapic love that resides in the eschaton and it's living out as justice in the here and now. And uh, Walter Storff right, rightly notes this as a weakness in Niebuhr. For Niebuhr, the eschaton represented a withering away of justice. When agapic love comes to its fulfillment, there is no need for justice anymore. And Walter Storff, by contrast, contends that the coming of the eschaton represented for Jesus not the withering away of justice, but its full rule. The relevance of justice is not confined to situations of conflict. And I would agree wholeheartedly. Walter Storff does not disagree so much with Niebuhr's application of love as justice in the world, but he does take exception to the idea that justice will not be present in the eschaton, incorporated by love. And as Walter Storff indicates, there is justice in the Trinity. Justice is eternally a part of God, just as his love is, and they belong together. So hence we have the significance of the ultimate ethic. The ultimate ethic is one of love. But what do we do because we're not there yet? How do we bring the love of the eschaton, that agapic love, to speak in the presence with the power of justice? Walter Storff also cautions us in this. He says we have to be open to recognizing the obligations that the needs the other places upon us do not allow any in-group, out-group classifications to deafen our ears and harden our hearts. Now that's going to be kind of hard for those of us who are used to being pushed into the out-group. You know, you're the out-group, we're the in-group. And how we balance that, I probably will need your help to work through that. I don't know exactly the answer to that yet. But I know that although God's love and justice is finally his to bring, it is ours to display, it is ours to manifest, it is ours to pursue, it is ours to seek, and it's ours to live out. What this looks like, for you, I cannot say. What it looks like for me, I don't know yet. This is part of it. And what this will look like for me in my context, I know I whisper every day as I sit in a chair where uh, hopefully women students don't see uh, academic leadership, church leadership as something beyond what God could do for them. That's a whisper. As I exercise the gifts that God has entrusted to me, that's a whisper of my worship to God. But what do I need to say once you reach a position where you actually are able to say something, that's what I wrestle with at present. What do you say? Where do you say it? And how loudly do you scream? Well, I invite your input and your prayers as I try to work that through. Because I'm convinced that there's a screen there somewhere. And it needs to have the right place and the right expression. This coheres entirely with one of my favorite statements from the Asby Statement of Faith. We believe the Bible teaches the equality of women and men. We believe God has given each person gifts to be used for the good of Christ's kingdom. We believe Christians are to develop and exercise their God-given gifts in the home, the church, and the world. We believe the Bible teaches that Christians are to oppose injustice. I'll be interested to hear what that means for you, as well as seeing how God will work that out in my context. Thanks very much for joining me.